På, som ni kanske ser, eh, Reverend James Nindro, som är en av anledningarna till att vi är här idag. Eh, medan vi gör det så tänkte vi börja, eftersom vi har ändå bara några minuter på oss, eller 20-30 minuter. Hej Anna. Jo, eh, this is a conversation in English, because unfortunately Egbert and James, neither one of them speaks Swedish. So I'm Hopefully you can understand what we say here. So, uh, I will present Egbert Veselink here, who is uh, a colleague of mine. We've been working together now for 13 years almost, yes. off and on. But you started much more this. Egbert is one of the leading business and human rights persons, uh, I would say, in the world. He has uh, worked, you can describe a little bit more. What have you done in the area of business and human rights, if we start there? Well, that started about 25 years ago when we started um, a dialogue with Shell um, because of the, um, the murder of uh, Ken Sarawiwa in uh, Nigeria. And um, in our discussion with Shell, we found out that they had no clue about human rights. And, um, and they f agreed that they should. So um, one, of the, one of the results of that um, process was that actually Shell was one of the first large companies in the world who refer to human rights in their business principles. And uh, that has since been um, uh, kind of uh, determined uh, w what I'm doing, which is basically working with uh, large oil and mining companies to, um, to make them act responsibly and, act, uh, and, and, and respect international law. And as you know, uh, as I might uh, w add, this report is called Unpaid Debt. You've been wor you started working on this, I think, 2007, and it was finally published in 2010. And what happened when it was published in June 2010 was uh, that the prosecutor, Magnus Elving at that time, he decided that this warranted for an investigation in war crime, aiding and abetting war crimes, that's complicity to war crimes. Can you tell me a little bit about the background of the work and how this came up? Yes, it started um, late 2000s when the uh, war for control over the oil areas in Sudan had degenerated into absolute slaughter and massive displacement. When um, churches and, and uh, civil society organizations in South Sudan called upon their European partners to, uh, to do something about it and basically to, to approach the European oil companies who were involved um, with a simple question um, that is uh, peace first and, and then exploit your oil, but not the other way around because if, if, if you're exploiting oil in the middle of the war, you're going to um, make the war worse, which is exactly what they've been doing. So. Um, And how come it becomes worse when you're exploring? I mean, you're not making any money out of it. Well, in, in, in this case, um, the, the very fact that there was oil and it was found by companies raised the, um, the credit worthiness of the government and allowed them to, to, to buy um, T-72 tanks in Ukraine, for instance, <laughs> at the time. And um, so it escalated the war. Um, but also the very fact that there was oil in the ground led, led to that area to become strategically important and in fact to become the focal area of the war because everybody, you know, the S Sudanese government wanted to control the area and the opposition forces didn't want to let them. So, you know, one on one is two. They started to fight over the area. That's how the very, you know, the very simple fact that you're looking for wealth somewhere in the ground um, can actually cause a conflict between people who, you know, yeah. who want to fight over, uh, the, over the revenues, which is exactly what happened I there. I do hear you. But, uh, well, uh, and, and, sorry, I'll not, continue. Not that, uh, clear hearing, uh, James, right. welcome. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Ha have, you he have you heard anything of what we're talking about? Can you hear us now? Yes, now I hear you. But when Egbert was talking, I was not hearing everything. Okay, you see Egbert is here. Can you yes. uh, describe a little bit your background and how you became involved in uh, 
what is now this police investigation. What happened for when you, when the Lundin came to your town? Well, uh, uh, because uh, Sudan by then, of which Sudan was part, was in a war, and that war has been going on for long. And it is the war that shut down the operation of Sheffield. Uh, Lundin came when the war was still on. So they did, they did not bother to know why in the first place the operation of oil was shut down. It was shut down because of war. Yet they decided also to come into operation while the war was still active. So that was a strange. Uh, we didn't know what is the motive. Is it a big way of getting money or what was it? But I think the government was also encouraging them to come uh, uh, against all the oaths in the uh, contested areas of Unity State. Uh, so when they came in, they came in with new strategy of clearing the route because they were concerned about their security in the area and therefore they, had, they needed a force a stronger force than the force that was in the oil field to deter and clear the area. And that force should be equipped and with full logistics, which, was, which Sudan government could not provide by then. So the coming of Lundin came with the enhancement of the capability and the capacity of the government. So they were able to acquire new arms, acquire logistics, use the oil facilities, including aircrafts, including intelligence, including radios, including vehicles, including personnel. So the people that were employed in the, in the company, whether they are South Sudanese or Sudanese, I think majority of them were security personnel. Yeah. And you, you come from a place just south of where the Lundin found uh, the oil in Tarjat, what they called it. It wasn't that name then. Uh, how many times you came from a small town called Lear, which is also a town of, of uh, another well-known uh, South Sudanese, uh, Riek Machar, who was also one of the actors within this war. How many times were your town and house burnt down and ransacked during these years? We talk about 1997, 2003, when the crisis. Yeah, of, of course, during, during the war, uh, there were only few places where you can access uh, services. When I say services, medical uh, services, uh, bush school, things like that. So one of those places were Mialdio, Bentiu, Lair, Kuit, Adok. And if you go further south, you go to Mayandip and Nyal and Gailir, uh, plus Tornyor. So Tornyor were the safest because it's very far from there and also very, very far from Adok. And because the road linking Adok Port uh, with Tarjas and Bentiu is coming from Bentiu, past Tarjas, past Mirmir, past uh, uh, Rukwai, then coming to there, from there coming to Piling, Piling coming to Adok. That's so the building of the those, road. Those are the, the road they were trying to open. So everybody move away from those roads because uh, it's not a peaceful kind of development. It's not a development. It's a war uh, route that to facilitate the movement of the soldiers to clear the road. So the road, I, I, I heard several times the Lundin was saying we brought development. We opened roads. That they brought wealth <laughs> with the road. Though. 
Yeah, I think that's a big lie because those roads were open to facilitate the movement of the of Sudan army, the South, plus the militia of Paulino Matiba. Which is, so uh, not, he was allied with uh, the government yes. of Sudan. Yes. So I, so I was in, uh, in there, uh, coach, and those areas, which are, uh, I mean, when I say Lair or Kuit, the vicinities, because inside Lair town is uh, the government forces, so we, we go around. Yeah. Yes. And uh, my experience with meeting many of your, you and your friends, and the, I might have to say he's wearing a priest because he is a reverend, he's a pastor in United State and uh, and I be, you have always worked for peace and the better of the people in Unity State now. I think I, I want to congratulate you. I saw you that you became the bishop now. So. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I'll ask uh, Egbert, uh, because we are now in a situation that we learned something, the, this investigation, police investigation, has found much, much more than we c anyone could have found. So maybe... Um, we are now waiting for a long, long time, first from the investigation. It's not we, I mean, m basically the, the people of South Sudan who want justice are the ones who are waiting. So where are we now? Well, we, we are very close. I mean, this is the one of the longest criminal investigations in Swedish history, and it's probably going to one of the biggest and, and longest uh, trials in Swedish history. Um, but we're getting there. Uh, the court has just yesterday announced that uh, it has scheduled the 20th October to prepare the trial together with the defense and the public prosecutor. And 20 October because they're waiting for a decision by the Supreme Court about the last possible straw helm that, that the defense has used to, to, to delay and stop the process, which is an appeal by one of the suspects, Alex Schneider, before the Supreme Court claiming that Sweden has no jurisdiction over him. Um, we'll see what the outcome will be, uh, but in any way, 20 October is, is uh, the start of the preparation, which means that a trial could start within six months afterwards. And that is really incredible news, because you know, June 2010, and now that, that is a very, very long time, which just shows how difficult it is to um, investigate these kinds of crimes against a very, very well-funded corporation that, that spends, at this moment, um, 8 million US dollars in legal uh, no, for its lawyers this year. And this trial hasn't even started. And they use that money basically to frustrate the process, to make life hard on, on the prosecutor. And and wi with a lot of impact, because I'm I'm sure if 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 we would have had a normal, uh, no less well, less overly funded uh, suspects, the trial would have been over a long time ago. Uh, but it's not. Um, so it's 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 looking good in that sense that finally the victims, where it's all about, and where Lundin and the suspect never talk about, uh, may, you know, now I think have a real uh, perspective that by mid next year, um, their case will finally be, f be heard in court. And uh, Reverend, I think you are one of the first uh, people that were heard and you're also one of the victims in the crime case. So there are about th 30 of you, but then there are maybe hundreds of thousands that were also victimized by this war. What is your hope for this uh, criminal case in Sweden so far away from where you are? I can't hear you now. I don't think your sound is on. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, saying we have been waiting for this long since I was uh, uh, since I recorded uh, my statements and several others after that. So to hear that we are close, uh, I think it gives us hope and is telling us that. 
uh, there is a hope in waiting. Uh, so we, we are happy to, to, to see that day and we are looking forward to it. And we trust in the judicial system in Sweden that uh, we will be uh, heard and the case will be decided on and we are going to win the case. Yes, uh, we sure hope so. Uh, even if you don't win, I think it's a big, big step that it's been brought to the attention and that you will be able to describe to the world what happened to each and every one of you who are there. Uh, often we describe in, uh, in this case that it's, uh, and you've told that many times, that it's, this is a very unique case. Uh, I mean, human rights infringements in business has been in many places and wars have been uh, waged but what is it that makes the, uh, the Lundin's actions and their partners actions in Sudan so unique? Well uh, there are many cases in in history where um, business interests private sector interests play a role in 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 in, in, in conflict and war um, but very rarely this reaches the court. Um, the the first example was, of course, um, an, uh, the, the Nuremberg trials, when um, individuals, Frick and, and uh, Krupp, were, um, were sentenced for, um, for war crimes. Uh, the only cases since have been two small one-person businesses um, in the Netherlands who've been um, sentenced uh, for war crimes committed, one in, in Syria, and or complicity war crimes, one in Syria and the other in Sierra Leone. And this is number four. And, and it's a big case. It's a billion do multi-billion dollar company. It's um, a very wealthy, very well-connected uh, people. It's um, a reliable legal system, as, uh, as the Reverend said. Um, and it is massive crimes. It is really huge. This is, um, I mean, conflict business and human rights is my business in a way, but, but a case as big as this in terms of uh, the amount of victims, the number of death, the looting, enslavement, maiming, raping, killing, it, it, the, the scale is outrageous. And the, um, the involvement of the company is also so much clearer than it usually is. Um, the, the prosecution accuses uh, the company of facilitation of massive crimes over a long period of time, repeatedly. Basically, the, the, the main accusation is that the suspects have um, uh, requested and facilitated and supported and promoted uh, with the government in Sudan that the government in Sudan take offensive actions to prepare the road for their for their operations and offensive actions with that government, uh, everybody knows what that means it means basically bombing, enslaving, killing, and, and chasing uh, the population away, which is what happened over a period of five years. That is that is that is big, and um, another absolutely unique thing in this case, and uh, and here again. Uh, long lived the, the Swedish uh, legal system, um, the prosecution has decided to apply the anti-organized um, crime uh, legislation on the company. One of the aspects of that crime is that uh, criminal proceeds can be confiscated, which is what the prosecutor has announced. In case of a conviction, it will confiscate uh, about 150 it will request, sorry, it will request the court to confiscate about 150 million U.S. dollars um, in, uh, in criminally obtained benefits from the company. And that is quite unique. It's also interesting to see what will then happen with that money. Because the, of course, our, our objective is, is justice for the victims. Justice for the victims has the several dimensions that the truth is spoken that apologies are, are expressed, that they're heard and recognized, and that they receive compensation reparation for their damages. 
Now the last part is has a financial dimension. It's not necessarily the most important part, but it is of course a, an Im an important part. Um, now we believe that in case of a conviction, the, the com even without a conviction, in fact, the company should be paying uh, compensation. Uh, now, but there's no legal way to make them do that uh, so easily. Uh, but in this case, there is maybe a parallel alternative that should not supplant it, but what will the Swedish government do with that $150 million in case of a conviction? Um, well, my answer is I don't <laughs> have to tell you <laughs> what I think they should be doing, of course. They should do justice to the victims. Yeah, and it's uh, and also a lot of the money that was well basically all of the money and the funds that they profited from Sudan went into investment in Norway. That's another issue. The um, the Lundin used all that money to buy concessions in Norwegian waters, and they hit the jackpot there. I mean, it, it turned them from from a small size company into a multi-billion dollar company. They became really rich. They washed this this blood money in the Norwegian continental waters and boom, they became billionaires. Um, now an interesting, so which means that, I mean, when we're talking about amounts of money for compensation reparation, we don't know, but for a multi-billion dollar company, th th they should be able to pay it out of their pocket without noticing it, really, which is, of course, they, they don't want to do that, of course. Um, but now what happened last year, immediately after the indictment, Lundin sold all its assets to a Norwegian company, and it changed its name. This is just an act to protect the, uh, the, in the, the investors, among whom the AP funds a Swedbank, uh, all, all the major Swedish financial institutions have made a lot of money from, from, su uh, from, uh, from Sudan and from Lundin. And now uh, they suddenly, magically, all, that, all those assets have disappeared. And they are now owned by a Norwegian company that says, oh, I got nothing to do with Sudan. While Lundin has even changed its name, it's now called Orön Energy after the island that where where the where the, where the uh, in the in the where, where, where the family spends its summer holidays and uh, and it's almost empty it's it's worth just enough to pay the forfeiture and 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 the and the, and the lawyers cost and this way you know through legal trickery basically the no, the mentality, the attitude with which Lundin started in 1997, which is long live the money and we don't care about the population, goes on until today. Not a single word about the population. No s not a single s sense of sympathy with, uh, with, with what happened there to these people. And now again, of course, magically making their money disappear into an entity where these people can never ac have access to. Outrageous. Yes, uh, we have a couple of minutes here left. Uh, James, I know once you said uh, it's because of the company said there was no one living there where they explored for oil or where the road went through. And I remember sometimes you say it, it's like they deny we ever existed. Can you describe a little bit how that feels that being not being there or not existing of all the people that suffered? I think this sound uh, comes after a while. You just continue. Yeah. yeah. That was in response to what Lundin was claiming that when they went there, there were no people in Tarjia, there were no people in those roads that they opened. Uh, to, to me, f first of all, it's a lie. Number two is denying that people exist. So if there were no people uh, in, in that area, uh, how, how, how do they know that this, this, the road was passing through here and we should open here and there? 
is because there are people who know the area very well, which they use. Uh, so that was like, is closing their eyes and trying to deceive the world that there were no people there. I, I think in this world, there's no place that has no owner in, in the entire world. Every place is owned by certain communities. And it happened that our community in, in that area. And these are the people who are trying to raise their voice and say, this is our right. Uh, to, to me, Lundin uh, 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 was trying to deny uh, facts that are available and known by everybody, yeah. Maybe also one of the other arguments we often hear from the, not only Lundin, but many investors and, and companies is that this will bring wealth in the future. Now, we, we are 25 years since they began looking for oil in uh, South Sudan. And if you look at it, what has oil, what is the situation today for the people in Unity State with oil and income? Has well, it been a blessing for you? Yeah. Uh, the, of course, oil, if it is invested during peacetime, it will generate development, it will generate wealth. But unfortunately, and that was the first reason that the first operation was suspended, because there was war. And uh, people know that when we are doing this, during the war, opportunists would come and loot the country. And that's what exactly happened. That was why uh, uh, the chevron was, 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 was uh, operation was suspended. So chevron was the American company that was bought before Lundin. company. When it was suspended, suspended. The reason, the main reason is because there was war going on. And the people suspended Chevron because we know if the exploration of oil continues while people are in war, the people who will benefit are not people from the area, would be now the Arabs. Well, uh, Lundin did not consider that. They thought it is an opportunity. If people are in war, then they can do whatever they want and then they will blame it on the war, as if they don't know that war is there. They cannot claim that they don't know because they were told. And because the previous company that was there also moved out of, of, of the place because of war. Uh, the, 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 the situation now, although uh, the operation has been going on for, for some time, but because of war, nothing more uh, the people are benefiting they are benefiting less because we are in a, we, we are in war situation that has been created by Lundin because if they if they did not come to to, to 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 explore the oil the oil would be still there now and would be explored and and, and, and extracted when peace is, is ascertained but because the they, they violated all that, and they came during the war, in the context of war, then they left when they are leaving Caius. So whatever is continuing now is what they made. It's not new. It's the Caius they left. Thank you very much, Reverend, and it's very good to have you here, and I hope to see you soon. And uh, Egbert, we only have a couple of minutes, but afterwards, uh, if you want to stay and talk to us, we'll be here either by the tea type or a table outside here, just out in the center there. Thank you, Egbert, and uh, thank you for all the dedication you have done <laughs> on this and coming to Gothenburg to talk t to us about this, just for a short tip. Thank you very much, and thank you all thank for you. coming to this seminar.